Hi there, it's me, Jordan Van Haslow. Welcome to Jordan Van Haslow and Friends live on Hot 702.5 FM Las Vegas. Let's get on with the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Showtime with Jordan Von Haslow and Friends right here on Hot 702.5 FM Las Vegas. I am so excited to chat with today's guest. He is an entertainment writer, and he's been featured in, in magazines and periodicals, um, a variety of them, The Advocate, CBS Watch, where he was the deputy editor, In Touch, TV Guide. I miss the old TV Guide. We'll maybe talk about that a little bit. And he's also written four books, all based on television shows. So his first was Will and Grace, Fabulous the Uncensored, and it was the authorized companion book to that NBC series. His second book, The Q Guide to the Golden Girls, was followed by Golden Girls Forever. I'm sensing a theme. We'll have to discuss that. And his most recent book is entitled All in the Family, the show that changed television. And it features a remembrance of, a remembrance of TV legend uh, Norman Lear and dozens of All in the Family stars and writers, and producers, directors, crew, and guest stars. And it also features an introduction by Jimmy Kimmel. But accomplishments aside, I'm so looking forward to this because our guest, our guest is a TV holic. And he is a pop culture junkie, just like me, a man of my own heart. So without further ado, please welcome Jim Colucci. Hi, Jim. Thank you so Hi. much for joining us. <laughs> Jordan, it's my pleasure, especially after an introduction like that. I loved it. <laughs> Absolutely. So I want to learn all about you. I want to learn you were born and then what happened. But before we get to it, <laughs> before we get to that, I have to ask you the most important question, the most important burning question, particularly as we move into what I'm seeing is a very long television drought due to the writer and actor strikes. What are you watching right now? Oh gosh. I mean, I am, I am loving only murders in the building season three. Uh, I am waiting for the Gilded age season two, which comes October 29th. Uh, I, you know, honestly, I, I love my reruns and I am stuck in the 80s and 90s in some ways. Of course, I watch all the new stuff and I love so much new stuff. But I have a little ritual where every night before bed, I watch a murder she wrote on Hallmark Channel or, or a Golden Girls. I've now, you know, uh, with the, the drought of new stuff, I've been rediscovering, not that I really ever stopped watching, Seinfeld, Friends, King of Queens is my new edition. And then I, I was on a trip with my husband and my dog and my dog wasn't doing well. And we stayed in, in Palm Springs uh, some nights and we would, we got addicted to watching Frasier. And now that my dog has passed away, we've still continued the tradition of watching Frasier every night. We watched three or four of them since there are 11 seasons. It's plenty of, of uh, content to keep us busy for weeks and weeks. So Frasier is like your, your, your evening ritual. Now it is. Yeah. But, you know, I change as I as we burn through an entire uh, series, I start over on something else. So uh, but yeah, I like to go back to the classics as I'm also watching the new stuff. And as I said, with there being a lack of new stuff uh, this summer, I did, of course, watch and just like that. And I watched plenty of other shows, but there's been time to go back to the classics. Yeah, absolutely. So talk talk to me about your love affair with television. Is this something that's been the case since you were a kid? Like, since can I uh, <laughs> go for as it? As early as I can remember. It's funny. You you said, oh, the, this interview is about birth to whatever. And I laughed because I, I have for years done these interviews for a program that's now called The Interviews, but it used to be called The Archive of American Television. And it's a program mm -hmm. for the TV Academy in Los Angeles. And it's it's a wonderful program because it does these archival really day long interviews with the giants of TV to get their stories on tape before, unfortunately they would pass away. And mm -hmm. the, we, when we sit these people down and we warn them, this is going to take all day. You're going to be exhausted talking five hours, six hours. We say, this is an interview that starts at birth and ends at breakfast this morning. And, <laughs> and I know what a daunting interview that is to be on either side of, to conduct or, of course, to be interviewed. So I had to laugh when you said that. <laughs> um, but going back almost to the birth part, I do. I was always obsessed with television. I 
learn to read uh, from Electric Company and learn to you know spell and 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 everything from Sesame Street and Electric Company. I actually have an uh, intellectually disabled brother who's a year older than I am, and my parents would park us in front of the TV. There was actually a TV near our cribs and hope that it would stimulate him to do some of the things that I was already doing, like talking. And it didn't really do that much for him, but it did for me. I really not only learned so much from those shows, but I also just became hooked on television. And t TV was always a place, even when you grow up in an imperfect family, which I'll say that I, I did, and I know so many of us did, so we all get it. Um, TV is a great place to escape, especially if you're a little gay kid, if you're not good at sports, if, uh, if there are other things that are outlets for other people that might not appeal to you, but TV did appeal, especially sitcoms, because everything was over and solved and better within 22, 23 minutes. And for the most part, no one, everyone left with their dignity. And I say for the most part with an asterisk, because what we viewed as the dignity of a gay character or a, a person of color back in the 70s wouldn't fly today in terms of the, some of the solutions that happened. They wouldn't have, they wouldn't satisfy our, our, our requirement for happy ending today. But back in the day when, when I was watching these shows, I, I loved that everybody seemed to get their say, at least for what was permissible at the time. And all the problems seemed to have a solution. And so mm -hmm. why, how appealing is that? Yeah, yeah, totally. So, so with that, at what point did you decide okay, I, I love TV, TV is a safe space, TV is a happy place. At what point did you start putting two to two together to say like, okay, I want to work in television? A lot later than I, I do that. A lot later than I should have because I didn't know how to do that. I pursued a much more traditional career path at first. I was- Where'd you grow up? I'm sorry. I grew up in Wayne, New Jersey, just 20 okay. miles outside of New York City. Yeah. Uh, I, I pursued a much more traditional career path. I, I studied business and engineering at college at University of Pennsylvania. And I really, I, my first job was in management consulting and programming. And I really was headed off on a path that was not making me happy. And I knew it didn't make me happy from the moment I started studying it. It was just the pressure that I felt to do that, which I uh, foolishly caved into. Um, but at one point when I was living in Arlington, Virginia and working at this consulting company, I started thinking, you know, I, I love Cheers. I'm going to try writing a Cheers spec script. I had read that that's what you do. You write a spec script and you get an agent. And that is kind of old advice. It's not really how it works anymore to get into TV. But at the time, in the, in the 90s, it was. Um, and so I just started, it kind of put the idea in my head. And then as I was liking my career less and less, I started using television, my old standby, as my outlet, but maybe not just watching it, but trying to write a little bit, even for my own education or my own fun. I didn't mm -hmm. necessarily know what I was going to do with any of these scripts um, and taking classes and reading books and literally learning as much as I could about the discipline. And then a lucky break came and it wasn't the break I wanted or, or needed or, or still need, uh, but it was a different kind of break and it was really great. And that was after I had started dating my now husband in 1996, he, he wrote for TV Guide and he was on staff there like a retainer where he would just write a certain number of uh, stories per issue. And he had chronicled this new call show called The Sopranos just as it was coming out. So I guess this was what, 1998, maybe? Eight, something like that. Yeah. yeah. And so he had written about the show pretty extensively, gone behind the scenes and, and interviewed the actors, including Gandolfini, even before the show premiered. And we got to go to some fun events. And that was great. But TV Guide also wanted to cover the, the show kind of in a secret way, particularly in the year, I think it was 2000 or 99, I'd have to look and see when my story came out. There was a lucky break in that The Sopranos announced, partly as a publicity stunt, that they were doing a open casting call in New Jersey, in Harrison, New Jersey, in a high school. Uh -huh. and, you know, come one, come all, audition for this show that by now was a phenomenon, The Sopranos. And so TV Guide wanted to cover that, but more in a stealth way. They didn't want to send an official reporter they wanted to do a like a man on the street. What's it like going to a Sopranos open casting call story? Mm -hmm. And they called my husband to cover it. And then just as they were talking, they realized, wait a minute, you've interviewed them so many times. If any of them is there that you've met, your cover is blown. Who else can we send? And they remembered that I am an aspiring writer, having I had met his editors. 
And I also happen to have an Italian last name and I'm from New Jersey. And so I got the assignment and uh, to go to the Sopranos casting call and cover it for TV Guide. And it ended up being a disaster because <laughs> I a, am not a morning person and left the city too late. I had to commute out of the city to do it, but it was not completely my fault because the Sopranos was such a phenomenon that 20,000 people overwhelmed this little high school. Oh my God. So the, <laughs> so, so, so the parkway it looked like, like Bruce Springsteen was exactly, performing or something. <laughs> exactly. That was just what I was going to say to the point where all of the local roads and all of the highways around Harrison, New Jersey were shut down. So I got stuck on route 280 in complete bumper to bumper traffic because they had closed, the cops had closed the exits. And <laughs> So by the time they reopened the exits and I made it to the high school, they the overwhelmed casting people had locked the doors of the school and said, no more, no more. We're not seeing any more people. But there were still thousands of people standing outside demanding to be seen. So I got to interview people who got shut out of the, the Sopranos casting call because of its popularity. And that kind of made for a funny story. But uh, that was my intro. And then once... <laughs> I had was able to turn probably a disastrous situation into a story that still could run in TV Guide. I just figured, you know, the door was open. Uh, let me continue to try to walk through it. And I think that's a lesson for everybody. For Certainly for me, it was a lesson that be prepared to jump in and do what it is you say you want to do. And, and you put your money where your mouth is, even if you feel like you don't know what you're doing or you're going to mess up, just yeah. jump in and do it. And maybe it'll work out and maybe it'll leave the door open to try to do it again and you'll get better next time. So I just continued to pitch stories to TV Guide and from there uh, reached out to book agents because I had always as a kid been obsessed with TV and I'm, because I'm so old and I predate the internet, <laughs> nowhere to go for stories and information about your favorite shows other than we, my parents didn't even subscribe to TV Guide, but a TV Guide feature story, which is only a certain number of words. Totally. And, or that what I would read religiously was the Q&A TV column in our local Sunday newspaper. And mm -hmm. so people would write in with a specific question. Hey, how did they film so-and-so on that show last week? And I, you would just get little bits of information. And I always fantasized about writing a long form, a book that would give all of the information about a show. Because when I love a show, I want to crawl inside my screen and look around. I wanted to be the fourth Brady boy in that bedroom and have a bunk there and be able to look in all those drawers and, and you know, go into that bathroom. I, and I just always felt that way about shows I loved. So I wanted to write a book that was the equivalent of that, giving all that information. And eventually with the TV Guide credentials, it raised me to a point where I was able to attract the attention of an agent and start pitching ideas and have a book career. So it all started from that Sopranos moment, just saying yes when the opportunity arose. Yay. And so do you miss it all your time working in consulting or do you? Ever... No. Oh, no. <laughs> I, mean, I miss a steady paycheck. Uh, but again, I'm such a dinosaur that the technology that I got trained in in consulting, the specific kind of um, document imaging software that was is now very commonplace. When you get if you look at those images of your checks that you can see when you go online, it's that kind of stuff about mm -hmm. capturing images and, and transferring them into data. Um, it was all very specific and it was all very pre-internet. And had I stayed at that company a few years longer, it would have been outmoded and I would have been having to reinvent myself within a field I didn't even like. So I kind of got out at the right time just by luck. Wow. There you go. Luck and preparation, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, every, isn't everything luck and preparation? I mean, don't they say that, you know, the success is not only waiting for your opportunity, but recognizing the opportunity and having the preparation to go for it when you and get jump right in it. Exactly. Jump right in. If someone, if someone were to come to me or to anybody who's listening, and if you have a fantasy of being a TV writer from your favorite show and say, Hey, you want to write for our show? What do you got? You have to have a sample to show them. So if you want to be a TV writer, start writing TV. And even if you don't think you have anywhere to show it, uh, you have those samples ready because you never know when the door will open. I mean, especially if you're looking for the door, if you're, if you're living somewhere far from production areas and you're, and you're hoping that you're going to, someone's going to call you out of the blue, probably not. But if you're looking for the, 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 the crack in the wall to use another metaphor and you finally find it, have the tools to, to Jimmy it open and get through. Right. So talk to me about 
just like what a day in the life is of like a freelance entertainment writer. So like, cause you're, you don't work for, you're not an employee of a specific publication. So like, are, do you like do publications that you've sometimes worked for call you and, and offer you assignments or are you kind of like always looking for a story? Oh, this will be an interesting story. Let me pitch it to this, you know, outlet. Oh, the outlet wants it. So now I can move the story. Like what's, what's your, what's the process of, of getting things from your head to, to the page or the screen? It's really both just what you described. A lot of times, I mean, I'm always getting press releases or going to TV conferences and saying, oh, this makes a story or this is a show I love. Let me find an angle to write about. And then going back to editors that I know and have worked with or even pitching ones that I'm referred to to try to land that story. But it also happens that editors you've worked with will call, especially if it's a show they know you love or they know you're an expert on. Um, But actually, I haven't been in that part of my career in a while. And I do miss that uh, because I've been writing books and books are so all consuming that I really don't, I'm not good at juggling. Some people are, and I I wish I could say I am, I I admire it. I'm not good at juggling a short form project and a long form project at the same time. I'd really rather focus. And uh, particularly because the books I've written, I've really been lucky enough to be able to interview hundreds of people associated with each show. And that just that scheduling and and juggling and transcribing and figuring out where that information is gonna fit within the framework of a book kind of consumes my whole brain and I wish it didn't. So I have been working for the past seven years on my next book on The Love Boat, which comes out in 2024. And that was such a joy because the anybody who was anybody in the 70s and 80s went on that show. Totally. And not actors, singers and athletes and Andy Warhol. And yeah, it was the dancing players. with the stars of its day. Yes, yeah, <laughs> what a great analogy. Yes, it was. Uh, so yeah, so it, it, that was so much fun getting to track down and I tracked down 400 of these people that, uh, getting to talk to them and then synthesizing every little bit of information that they had, because this is, I always compare writing a TV book to doing a puzzle. And with some shows like Will and Grace or the Golden Girls or All in the Family, I would say it's like doing a 500 piece puzzle. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but the love boat has been like doing a 5,000 piece puzzle because the show was so guest star driven with, with, with a show, like say the golden girls, it's beloved. And everybody knows every line of that show. And so you can write about it at the most granular level level, which is really fun for me, but as a, as research, it's not as hard because it was basically the four girls and maybe a guest star or two each week. Mm -hmm. And that and it's a half hour long and so there was a more finite list of people who might have a behind the scenes story it would be one of the four actresses the main actresses or one of those guest stars or the writing staff it's still a a, a sizable group but with the love boat because it was so guest star driven and an hour long and each episode was comprised of three vignettes that Mm -hmm. made up the episode and those so there would be 10 or 12 guest stars per episode and now you realize oh it's to, to find the, the, the good story about this episode, I might have to search through interviews with 12 or 15 people each mm-hmm. for, each ep- for each of the nearly 300 episodes. And so it's such, everything's broken down into such smaller chunks that to put it all back together again required so much more work, but it was so worth it and so fun. And that's my long-winded way of answering and saying that <laughs> my, my career these days is focused <laughs> on things that take me seven years at a time. And so I'm not as, uh, is in tune with what it takes to land a magazine story these days, although I do a, ca- a few occasionally when they cross my path. But really, books have become my love. Oh, I love it. I love it. So how do you even go about, so just talking about how the love boat and how granular you have to be because it was literally like three many movies starring someone else every week. <laughs> right, exactly. So, so how do you, you know... Like, how do you edit yourself down, right? Because I imagine, right, especially with the passion you have for it and your interest in it, you could probably write volumes on the list. You know what? <laughs> you are so reading my mind and my poor editor's mind because that's where we are right now. <laughs> uh, with every book I've ever written, I've handed in a crazy person's manifesto <laughs> that is probably five times longer than it should be. And then it comes down to the let's cut. And... <laughs> Uh, so we're doing that on the love boat right now because yeah, ha- having spent so much time and met so many people, there are so many great stories 
and we are making it publishable <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> um, but the Golden Girls, we had to do the same thing. But you know, and nothing, nothing really was cut that was the marrow of the show. That it, it was always something that was like this was a funny aside, and that I've used in interviews and elsewhere. But yes, it's very hard to to restrain yourself when you have passion and you tend to be a, a wordy person anyway, as you can tell I am from this interview. Um, you, you're, I'm, I'm an editor's challenge. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So do, when you come to these books, like, do you come with an angle or do you just come like and say like, this is something I'm interested in. So I'm just going to like dive in and research and figure it out as I go along. That is such a good question because up until The Love Boat, I would say I always came in with an angle because mm -hmm. it was a show that, for example, the, my first book, Will and Grace, was on the air at the time uh, as I was writing the book. But of course, my angle was this is a groundbreaking show with two LGBT leads. This has never happened before. I mean, that's a pretty obvious angle. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also the purpose is to celebrate the show as it's happening. So everything was very current. It all had to feel very current and like we're in the midst of this groundbreaking moment. So that was kind of how I approached Will and Grace. Uh, with the Golden Girls, it was easy to approach because the show had ended in 1992, but here I was in 2006 doing my research and the show was just getting bigger every year and I could see it happening. I could see how the, the repeats of the show on Lifetime had kept the show building over the years and that people weren't starting to make, even though there was no official Disney made merchandise at the time, Disney being the studio that owns the rights, there was all this fan made stuff on Etsy. And I could see just when the, when the actresses would do book signings or DVD signings, how the crowds just got bigger and bigger each time. And so that was the angle about, this is a, the irony of a show ostensibly about old ladies that when NBC put it on in the beginning, they thought, oh, only old ladies are gonna watch this. What are we even thinking doing this? And it proved this weird paradox that it was so specific about older people and yet it appeals to everyone from age two and up. Mm -hmm. and just keeps getting bigger. So that's an obvious angle. Oh my God, here's the, the show that nobody thought would work or should even go on the air. And it's become a show that just won't, that gets bigger and bigger and has eclipsed just about everything else. What do you think that, that's a sidebar, but what do you think that is? Because I do think that that's really fascinating how this show about four old ladies really appeals to like every demographic and nobody has a negative thing to say about it other than maybe it's on too often. <laughs> what do you think, <laughs> you know, but like, what do you, what do you think that that is? Because like even a lot of our even, you know, classic shows aren't necessarily don't have that same you know, like the mashes of the world and don't necessarily right. have that same like universal appeal. What do you think it is about that show in particular? I think it's so many things. First of all, you can't ignore the fact that it is the perfect storm of acting and writing mm -hmm. coming together. It is some of the world's best comedy writers, some of whom were just starting out in the business and have gone on to create other huge hits. But mm -hmm. we're, we didn't even know at the time that they were working on the Golden Girls that they were among the best comedy writers in the world. But a combination of veterans and these young people combined with these four actresses who are the best comedic actresses. I mean, you add Lucy and a few other people and you got the top 10. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, they're incredible. So that is the, the biggest answer. But I would say that the irony, the reason why I called it a paradox is there's a, there's a paradox about television or about, I guess, any writing that says the more specific you make a the characters and situation, the more universal the appeal can be. And so I think that we all, even though we weren't all necessarily in our 60s and gray haired and living in Miami, the women had such specific character traits and needs and experiences and relationships with each other that we all saw something of ourselves in them. Mm. And there is definitely something to be said for this theme that the show had of surrogate family and of them being outsiders who bond and form this team where it's us against the world. And because women and particularly older women were always treated like that in society. You get to a certain age and you're invisible. Who cares about you? I mean, that's why NBC thought, why are we putting the show on the, on the air about four old broads? That's the way people talk about women and still do, particularly older women. And so they were outsiders and yet they, came together and made this thing that everybody would want to be a part of. 
And I think that that appeals to everybody because any one of us can look at one dimension of our lives where we felt like an outsider, whether as an LGBT person, as a person of color, as an older woman, as a woman at all, as a certain religion, everyone as an immigrant to this country, any one of us can think, uh, there have been times where I felt outside and I wished, and I, and I found people who made me feel good about myself and, and be, formed my family, particularly the LGBT community, often rejected by their biological families, we can find our, our we can make our families from our friends. And so those themes, I, I, I see uh, sorority girls who watch the show all the time, who are in college now or recently in college, who discovered the show and, and it was a bonding thing for them. And you would think, why are young girls caring about these four older women from 30 years ago? Because of the theme. And it just, it, it's it's universal. And I don't think it'll ever go away. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. But I digress. You were talking about, so you came in with the obvious angle there. Yes. And when doing that. And also uh, the All in the Family book, I actually was hired to write it with Norman Lear and it was Norman's project, it is Norman's project. And I was honored to be asked, oh my God. Um, and so the angle on that was we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the show All in the Family from the perspective of Norman telling his favorite stories about his favorite episodes. So that, that came with a built-in angle as well. The thing about The Love Boat was I just remembered when I was thinking, what do I want to write about next? And there are a lot of reasons to write a book about a show and, and reasons not to. Um, you want the show to be, in most cases, not still on the air because it's hard to catch up with production of a show because books move so much more slowly. But you also want the cast to be still around from an older show and available and willing to talk. You don't want there to be a definitive book already so that you're telling the same stories or rehashing. Um, it, it, there, when you go through all of those criteria, there aren't a lot of shows that I thought would make another, my next book uh, would make a good choice. I wanted to write about Big Bang Theory at the moment, but um, at the time they had a two-year renewal and I knew I'd be chasing a moving train again. And mm -hmm. now Jessica Radloff has written an amazing book about that show. So there's definitive book now exists and things like Seinfeld and Friends and they've been done. And, and I don't think that those casts would have fresh stories or want to sit with, sit with anyone to tell more stories. So mm -hmm. I, when I really look back at, okay, what makes me happy? What kind of show do I want to spend seven years with? Well, I remember back to being a kid and Saturday night when I'd be, it would be snowing in January in New Jersey and you could turn on your television and for an hour you could be in Puerto Vallarta in the sun with, with people you love from other shows coming together on the love boat. Um, but the problem was, how do you translate that feeling into a book? Mm -hmm. And that, so I didn't know the angle of how to do that uh, until I really delved into it. And it was the first time I really kind of went, I went in blind to interviews like, okay, what am I looking for here? And I, you know, I eventually found it and about how the show was so groundbreaking in ways you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, expect how it has become a cultural touchstone that in its own way won't die. Because even though, unfortunately, there were decades where it wasn't shown very much on television, if you talk to anyone of a certain age and say, Julie, your cruise director, they know what you're talking about. And mm -hmm. now CBS brought it back last season as a reality show. Princess Cruises uses it as their current ad campaign. Uh, and so it is something that has just, it has become part of the pop culture lexicon and I don't think it will fade away. Uh, and so those, I found that angle. And, but it, mm -hmm. it took a while. That, that, was, that was a scary experience for me, having a book that was a, a more, as I said, a more uh, granular puzzle where I then had to put it together and find what the story was there. Yeah, yeah. So in doing the work that you do, do you view yourself as, as an historian? You know, like, are you art? Like, is this kind of like doing similar to what the Academy does with those interviews? Like, do you see your work as like archiving these conversations from these people who are not going to be with us for a lot much, you know, much longer to talk about a time that really is, isn't, is, you know, is, has, has gone? Do you see yourself as that? Or do you see these as just like, you know, just entertaining page turners that people can kind of just like get into the zone? of that show and and it's and it's 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 less academic and more just for shits and giggles. It's both because obviously I want the book not to come off academic. I want it to come off as fun. I want you to be able to be, re go to each episode and read what happened behind the scenes and laugh at the crazy thing that happened between Carol Channing and Ethel Merman when they were filming a love boat that is, you know, has some off-color words in it. I want you to laugh at all this stuff. 
And that, so I want to make it juicy. And that's what I look for first. What's juicy, not juicy, scandalous, because that doesn't usually end up lasting the test of time anyway, but juicy fun. And, uh, but I, I have come to view myself as an archive. It's funny that you asked me that nobody's ever asked me that before. When I started with Will and Grace, I didn't view myself as that. I was writing about, I was 32 years old. I was writing about a show that was currently on the air. I think when you're young, you don't necessarily envision the passage of time. And so I never <laughs> really thought of that. But as I've then written about the Golden Girls and All in the Family and Love Boat, and I have either written stories that have been rediscovered or had, had would, would, have, would have died out had I not found them from uh, somebody else and put them on paper. That's a good feeling. But also now some of the people I've interviewed have passed. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, oh my gosh, I have an hour or two on tape with that person talking about his or her life and all of these great stories that happened both on the show I was writing about and when they went off on tangents. And I have that and it, it's on tape and it exists and it won't, hopefully won't die. It'll, it'll, we can put it somewhere. Um, yeah, I'm really honored. That, that I have gotten to meet the people I've gotten to meet over the past 20 years and preserve some of their legacy and, uh, and, and have other generations able to read about it. Yeah. So how do you see, like in terms of like the type of writing and the genre that you write in, how do you see that? Um, well, so like, for example, right in the 80s and the 90s, we all had a communal television experience, right? Because there's right. like four networks, right? So on Thursday night, we were all watching, more than likely, we were all watching the same show. And even if we were watching a different show, we knew what was going on in the other show. I mean, on, on another, you know, and what, and what you know, what, if on the show that we weren't, weren't watching. But now that we're in this place of where television is so splintered, you know, everyone is curating their own thing. Like, no, there's not really appointment television anymore. Everyone just kind of binges things when they want to binge it. So even if we're watching the same show at the same time, you might be two episodes beyond me. Um, so when we don't have like The Love Boat, like Golden Girls, th th these shows that like universally everyone's um, uh, rallying around, um, what do you think like that'll do to like the market for the type of books that, that you, that you, that you write. I don't think it'll affect my books for a long time, if at all, because first of all, I have been writing just coincidentally about all shows that were well before the streaming era. Right. Uh, but even if I write about a show that's in the streaming era, um, say I were to write about white Lotus, uh, there are shows like white Lotus that or like Gilded age, that are such appointment viewing in that fans don't want anything spoiled for them by, by people online. And so mm -hmm. they do tend to watch them close to day and date, or if not, they try to catch up as soon as possible. That I think that there are shows that are still communal experiences. Maybe it's not as wide as it was when there were only three choices because there are people who are just not interested in the White Lotus and they have so many other choices. But when you find your tribe, of people who speak the same same TV language you do. Yeah. And you say, how did you like White Lotus season two compared to season one? Odds are by now you're speaking the same language and they know what you're talking about. Totally. Um, so I think that there's a maybe the cat there's a catch-up period that is not, it's not as immediate as the water cooler talk the next morning. Hey, did you see that Seinfeld last night? Mm -hmm. Um, but it's still happening with the with the shows that are the most popular. And so I think that even when I eventually i'm sure we'll be writing about a show that's on streaming um i won't be spoiling it the very next morning for people who haven't seen it but i will i, I think we'll still be speaking the same language yeah are you a fan of unscripted television uh, not really but i can't <laughs> be a purist about it because i uh, have been sucked into some a few shows that i would say i'm i am semi not proud of uh, I grew up in in New Jersey, lived in New York, live in LA. So I do watch the Real Housewives of New Jersey, New York, and Beverly Hills. Uh -huh. um, sometimes I feel like I need a shower after watching an episode, but I'm I'm hooked. I mean, like I, to the point where I'm I'm so hooked that I am watching it day and date, and I am like, oh, is it Wednesday yet? Okay, this is a <laughs> New Jersey week. Okay, okay. Oh my God, after tonight, I'm gonna have to wait another week. Like I am really that hooked. So. Uh, I can't point a finger at people who love reality television, but I, I don't, I really, other than those three, I don't think there's any that I watch. 
Yeah. So we, 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 we can't expect like a behind the scenes of like the housewives of New Jersey. You know, you is probably gonna... could because there's certainly, you know, it's a finite number of episodes. There certainly is drama behind the scenes you could report on. You pro- One probably could. I don't know if I'd be the person for that, even though I have watched the episodes and know all the drama. <laughs> Um, just because I do tend to lean toward comedy, and 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 that's just again to spend that this many years obsessing about the details of something. Not that I couldn't spend that kind of time on a Real Housewives show; I probably could, but I think I might hate myself if I spent <laughs> years studying Teresa <laughs> Judice. And I think I would, I, I I would preserve my sanity studying Sophia Petrillo. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> was there, what was the, you, so you've interviewed a lot of people. You've had conversations with talent, crew, writers, some from the, you know, the golden age of television to, to more current people. Do you have like one experience of like an interview that like will always go down as like, oh my God, that happened. Or like, oh my goodness. That was the yes. Yes. most well, amazing conversation. Yes, and uh, I have a good version of that and a bad version of that, and there are okay. other ones that are that are uh, that are memorable, of course, because you get to meet your I- idols. I mean, I just I just can't believe I sat with Barbara Feldon of Get Smart and talked Get Smart with her in her house for hours, and I mean, I still email her on her birthday, and I get to know this woman who I always, you know I grew up loving. So like, I, 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 so many names are flashing through my head right now of, of just that where oh my god I got to meet this person and still know this person um, but in terms of the interview themselves the worst interview I've ever done I can say this now because the person has passed was Cloris Leachman and I fought to get to do that interview because I am such a Cloris Leachman fan but she drove me insane over the course of a day she was so out there and difficult and someday I'll tell that story more in more detail online because it is nuts but <laughs> it, i actually get ptsd when i start going into it so I, I i would probably ruin the rest of this interview because i would start shaking but so is she it, it was she just nuts or was that part of her shtick was being like crazy and like bitchy was that part of, like was it fun for her uh i don't know the answer to that i think it was a little of all of it but let's just start by saying she arrived five hours late oh. so <laughs> yeah you can go from there five hours late to, with her granddaughter in tow, her two-year-old granddaughter who wasn't supposed to be with us, who by an, 30 minutes into the interview was not wearing any clothes and ran around the room. And that's just the beginning of it. So I, oh, I love it. Well, yeah. they are kind of hippie-ish, right? I remember watching them speaking on reality TV on like Celebrity Wife Swap or something. And I feel like they live in like a cabin in Topanga and run around the house naked. I think that they're hippie like that. Yeah, I think she had a hit, some hippie side to her. Hey, look, I adored her as a performer. I had I saw her after that interview and she was, you know, wonderful to me. She sang a happy birthday to Betty White into my tape recorder that I could send to Betty. She just, she was a very fun, impulsive, talented woman, but she also had a side that I, she probably did enjoy torturing people. And <laughs> boy, did she get me that day. The flip side of that, is B. Arthur. And it started out as a tough story. And I tell this story all the time at Golden Girls conventions, and I'll make it shorter. But she didn't want to do the interview for the longest time. She felt she had talked about the show enough. She felt that it was an unhappy time in her life. She lost her mother at the time, and she had recently divorced her husband when the show started. She just didn't want to relive it. And I eventually, but I could also tell that what a sweet person she was underneath. The, people thought the way to interact with B was to play rough with her, which is the way mm-hmm. that characters address Dorothy on the show. And because B was tall and had a deep voice, people thought she was a tough broad. And let, let me let me antagonize her a little. That could not have been a worse approach to B. Arthur because underneath that very thin veneer of toughness, she was a really easily hurt, vulnerable mush ball with a heart of gold. But if you hurt her, you were dead to her. You know, she didn't want it. She ran away from you for the rest of, of, of knowing you. So... I luckily didn't start with the t- treating her like a tough broad, but I also made the mistake of doing the opposite extreme, which was being all obsequious with her and mm-hmm. she couldn't stand phonies either. So I would be on the phone like, gosh, Miss Arthur, I hope I get to interview. And she would cut me off like, oh, honey, no. You know, but something about her was gen- so generous 
that she would always say on every phone call where I called her and because she would always say, call back and next week, we'll talk again. And the same thing would happen where I'd call and she'd say, honey, I really don't want to do it. And I'd try to talk her into it. And she'd start to waver and say, honey, I can't talk about this right now. Call me later. And so eventually I did convince her to sit down with me. You should have just asked her like one or two questions each. I know. Each phone I know. call, you would have had your... <laughs> I know. It's true. I would have had to have a recorder on. And half the time she caught me, I was driving when she called back because I was afraid that if I didn't answer the phone every time she called, she would never call again. So, because mm-hmm. we were doing this pas de deux, like back and forth of this phone tag. And so one time she called me, I was driving. Another time she called me, I was in the middle of the Beverly Hills Public Library. And I answered the phone because I thought she'll never call back again. I was in the middle of the room and everybody immediately starts yelling at me. What are you thinking? You took a phone call in the library. Shut up. Hang up. They're screaming at me. And I'm trying to talk to B as if they're not there. And she's talking very slowly and deeply. And I can barely hear. <laughs> and people are screaming at me in the library, coming up and screaming in my face. Like, I, I just couldn't believe people get that in your face. These days, I think you'd be afraid that somebody had a gun in the library. But these people, I guess, because I was a library nerd, they thought they could yell in my face. And it was really, really flustering me and putting me off. And I couldn't hear B. And I tried to go leave my computer in the middle of the room and run to the window. But the windows didn't open. And I'm, I'm running around with people following me, screaming at me, get off your phone. And finally, I'd had enough. And I thought I covered the phone. But luckily, I hadn't. And the anger rose up in me. And I don't know, do you use four letter words? I will abbreviate the four letter word. I screamed at everybody, F you, it's B Arthur. <laughs> and that threw them so off that they all skulked away. And I hear B laughing her head off on the other side of the phone. And that's actually what, that's what secured the interview for me. Because after that, I think she saw that I wasn't just gonna be the subsequious nerd, that I had a fun and a real side to me and she loved it. She loved that I told off people in the Beverly. I told her what happened. I'm like, I'm in a library and these jerks are you know, telling me to hang up on you. And it, she loved it. <laughs> so I eventually did get to go to her house. Now, when I went to her house, it was actually a rented house that her kids had gotten for her because they were re- redoing her, her own real house. And so she didn't know where anything was. And she put her bare feet up on the coffee table. She was always barefoot. And for hours, we talked small talk. She didn't really want to talk Golden Girls at first. She wanted to talk more Maud. There was a point about an hour and a half into my being there where she mumbles under her breath, Judge Judy's on in 15 minutes, as if I, I would volunteer to leave so she could watch Judge Judy. And I'm thinking to myself, lady, I've been calling you for months to try to get this interview. I'm not leaving to watch <laughs> Judge Judy. So we kept going. And then you hear at another point in the interview, I guess I can watch Judge Judy another day. And we talked and talked. And then the deal had been in order to, to, for her to agree for me to come over that I would stay and have a drink with her afterward. And the problem was we finished at like five and I had to have a rental car back to Hertz in West Hollywood at six and we were in Brentwood. And she's like, what do you want? And she shows me all this a fully stocked liquor cabinet. She knew, knew where nothing else in the house was, but she knew where the fully <laughs> stocked liquor cabinet was. And I choose the least offensive thing I can think of to drink before getting behind the wheel. So I pick white wine and she empties out a bottle of white wine into the two biggest balloon goblets I've ever seen. So I'm drinking literally half a bottle of white wine. <laughs> And making small talk with B. And the small talk was hard because we had already talked about Golden Girls and Maude and all this time. And I also didn't want to talk about anything that would be painful for, painful for her. So we somehow came upon the topic of what they used to call back in the day, hag pictures. Like whatever happened to Baby Jane, where the mm-hmm. great actresses of, of yore were reduced to playing these hor- cheesy horror films. Mm-hmm. And she loved that. She loved, I think, seeing these great actresses reduced to playing schlock. And I told her about a film I had seen uh, uh, that called Persecution. I didn't know what it was called at the time uh, from the seventies in England where Lana Turner's son at the end goes crazy and makes her drink milk out of a bowl on the floor, like a cat. And that excited her. She said, I must have a copy of that. So that's, we bonded over hag pictures. And then at the end, <laughs> at the end I, and I also had to see, keep secretly trying to call Hertz and get them on the phone and saying, I'm going to be late with the car. I was flying out the next day. There was no after hours drop off. I had to be there by six. And I'm arguing with Hertz as B is telling a story. And finally, I, I again, I try, I pulled the B Arthur card. I said to the woman, I'm going to be a little bit after six, but can you please stay open? No, no, no. And I said, I'm with B Arthur. And the woman just said, 6.15. <laughs> so I did. I made it by 6.15. But as I'm leaving, after bonding with B over all this crazy stuff that was going on and 
and she told me a few more secrets about how she boycotted a Paley Center night of the about talking about the show because she just didn't want to do it. And she had lied and said she was sick. She really got real with me. At the end of it, as I'm walking out the door, I had an impulse. I don't know what gave me this impulse because it's not necessarily professional and I hadn't ever done it before or since. But I said to B, you know, can I give you a hug? And because I felt like I'd really had a breakthrough with her. I think that with B, people who made a first, a bad first impression with her by either being mean to her or by triggering one of her peccadilloes, like by wearing a baseball hat indoors or chewing gum, or if they had a bird, weird things that B had phobias about. Once you, once you made that bad first impression, that was it. But if you spent the time to talk to her and talk, particularly talk about something she loved, like the acting, she loved to talk about acting and, and people she admired. She was very generous with her, with her own fandom. Uh, you could break through that exterior. And once you did, you saw the real B and then you loved her. And I felt like I had gotten to do that that day. I'd gotten to spend enough of a time with her that I had broken through. And so I said, can I hug you? And she was hesitant, but I walked up. I had my computer bag over the shoulder. So I was a little awkward. I hugged her. And for the first split second, she was very stiff. And then I felt her, all of her muscles relax and loosen. And she kind of fell into my arms. And I thought, you know, this is a metaphor for my entire day. I'm never going to forget the feeling of B. Arthur loosening up and trusting me and kind of becoming my friend in that moment. It tears me. I'm tearing up just saying it. You can't see me right now. Um, and I'll never forget it. It was, it was the best interview I'll probably ever do. Wow. Well, I think that that's like a great place <laughs> for us to stop. I could keep talking to you for the rest of the afternoon, but unfortunately, well, I guess fortunately, um, we have sponsors, but I think that that's a lovely <laughs> story. <laughs> and I will, um, I love that. I, I love that. I think that that's so wonderful. That's so exciting. Where can we, where can our people in our audience follow you? I know you're you're on the Instagram, yeah? I'm on the Instagram. I'm on the Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Everything is my name, Jim Colucci. J-I-M-C-O-L-U-C-C-I. Awesome. And then the Love Boat book. So when is it, does it actually have like a release date yet? Or is it is it still is, coming I, soon? It's coming soon. I, it originally had a release date of April 2024, which now is coming very soon. And uh, there was a little bit of, of interior consolidation at my publishing company where things got moved around. And I am hearing hearing tell, hearing rumors that my book might now come out in the fall instead. So I don't want to promise anything, whether it's April or maybe September, October, but it's 2024. Cool. Well, we're going to look for it. And um, have you have you thought about what your next project is going to be i'm debating i've got a couple of ideas of shows that i again would just love to dive into and that made me laugh or make me in one case a show that's current i might be breaking my own rule and writing about a show that's on the air and currently making me laugh but, oh. uh, nothing i've nothing i've been able to uh, make a deal about yet that i can talk about okay well we will keep on um checking in with you on instagram and all that jazz and when your book comes out come back and and and, and chat with us again like i said i could I talk to you honored i mean just to talk about the follies episode of love boat alone carol channing ethel merman della reese van johnson cab calloway and the greatest Andy. episode in television history honestly i i watched that episode at least once a year <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean Ann Miller tapping on in the middle of the Love Boat dining room, and just it's just, I, yeah, I think it should be watched once a year. It should be like Sound of Music when they used to play it at Thanksgiving, or exactly, whatever. yeah, it, it, or Gone with the or Wind, the Christmas story, or whatever, year, yeah. a Christmas story. Yes, <laughs> I think you're right. I think we ought to petition that at least one of the networks, maybe ABC, its original home, should air the Love Boat Follies like at a holiday every year. That would make the world uh, a better place. I think that we should definitely do that. So I'm going to think about that. And while I do that, I want to thank our audience for joining us this week. And we'll see you next week for another episode of Showtime with Jordan Van Hazel and Friends right here on Hot 702.5 FM, Las Vegas. Hi there, it's Jordan Van Haslow. Yes, that Jordan Von Haslow. I don't know if you know this, but everyone's favorite radio show and podcast is now available on Spotify. That's right. 
Showtime with Jordan Von Haslow and Friends, my weekly one-on-one -on -one chat with some of the most interesting people I know in entertainment and the arts can now be streamed on Spotify. Uh-huh. I share real estate with Joe Rogan.